Hello everyone, thank you for coming. This is something that we've been wanting to do for a while. I felt like it's the right time to do it now. Um, Josh and I, we use Python quite a lot, uh, both in our old jobs and now. And we realised actually there's a lot of return on investment in learning Python and learning enough Python to get a lot of value out of it. And so we thought, you know, we might as well share what these things are and a much more condensed and tailored version to what everyone does on this call and what's relevant to your jobs. So, yes, I just want to make very clear from the beginning, this is not a programming tutorial. Uh, you won't go away from this and know how to code in Python completely. Uh, we're not going to go through details about what each um, semicolon means. This is a high level overview of the end to end pipeline of a data science project using Python. That's what it's trying to do. Our main motivation is basically to inspire you and give you a sense of urgency to learn this language and you'll find out why in a moment. But yeah, this is kind of more just a general overview of, of certain principles and how we use it in our day jobs. And it's not a, a, a detailed coding tutorial. In that light, don't worry if there are certain parts you don't understand and there's certain parts you do understand. That's OK. This, these things take a while to learn to get into your head and it might take some time. Um, we both are part of the Python community, naturally, and so we'll ask you to join Slack or to look at resources from there, but we'll get to that in a moment. Um, yes, please do ask questions on the way. I can't see the chat, so Josh, do let me know if there are questions. But yes, OK, so I want to start with just explaining actually what programming is. I'm going to assume that we don't know what programming is. I don't know what programming is, was last year. I do now. Um, I think the most simple way to understand programming is essentially basically helping. You have a problem to solve. We're human beings. We have problems to solve, but we are flawed. And we don't always have the mental computational capacity to solve problems very quickly. And so sometimes we need the help of a computer. And that's where programming comes in. It's a way of communicating with a computer, a computer system to help solve our own problems. But the thing is, uh, whilst computers are things that we can program, they are very dependent on what instructions we give them. And they also have their own set of rules, their own set of boundaries that we must follow. And that's um, those boundaries are in the form of syntax, which is how you write the code and the code itself. So what actual instructions you give it. So just to give a few definitions, so programming is to use code to make a computer perform desired actions. And code is a set of rules and instructions you give to a computer. Uh, one caveat here that I must say is uh, you can kind of program a computer to do almost anything. And so uh, whilst there are lots of things we could program, doesn't necessarily mean we should do those things. So there's always ethical considerations when you're doing programming. Um, the other thing to mention is actually like, what is this software that I'm using? You know, what is this thing that I'm hosting all this code in? This is called a integrated development environment, an IDE. And what it does, it has all the main sort of tools I need to run this code, to test this code and to share this code. It's all in one place. And the main thing I'm using now is called Google Colab. And we're using it because we, me and Josh and I, can collaborate on this at the same time and share it with you guys. So that's the tool we're using. Another thing I wanted to mention is just a bit about some principles to think about programming. And uh, like I said, it is very, very, it can seem very intimidating. I was very intimidated to learn. And I just want to kind of humanize this process a little bit. So my colleague, Pavel, he works at the University of Edinburgh and they have a medical school and we work together on a few projects and he has a few principles to think about programming and he says that programming is about storytelling, it's supposed to be social, it's a craft like knitting, it's supposed to be fun and it's very creative and I want you to kind of focus on section one and section four which is it's supposed to be fun. Um, and it's supposed to be telling a story. So he says, programming is a storytelling exercise. 
It's like telling a joke or negotiating bedtime with a child or telling the way to the tourist that doesn't quite speak your language. It's about sharing your thoughts in a language that's understandable to your audience while leveraging its strengths and avoiding its weaknesses. And the whole point of this tutorial is essentially just to show you some of the strengths of this language. So that's what kind of programming is, but, but why do we care about Python so much? Why is this such a popular language that people are talking about? So I just want to define um, Python a little bit. Uh, so Python is an open source, state-of-the-art programming language, and it's an open source language, which means, which means anyone can use it. It's free to use, free to distribute, and it's the way it's written is is relatively simple and kind of the way the way it's written is kind of like how a human would talk, kind of. And so a lot of people recommend it as your first programming language. Um, it's used for so many things. So it's used for data science, machine learning, data engineering, creating medical devices, software development, automation. And because of that, it is on both indexes for programming popularity, it is number one. Um, yeah, so that's pretty important to know. So this index here is showing what proportion of all the coding courses are people applying to do. And there's a 30% share of that being to Python. So a lot of people, 30% of people looking up coding courses are looking at Python courses. So I hope that gives you a little bit of sense of urgency about why this is a very important language. But like all programming languages, it's not a panacea. So there are other tools that might be better some of the time, and that's totally fine. Um, so sometimes you don't need Python. You can do a lot of very good data manipulation in Excel. Um, if you're an economist, I think economists tend to like using R because it's got very specific econometrics and statistical packages, and it works really well. And it's very good at data visualization. And sometimes you want something that's more robust for data visualization. So you might use Power BI, Tableau, Foundry, that kind of thing. So it's not, not the best at everything, but um, my colleague Chris Beely, he described Python as a Swiss army knife programming languages. You kind of do a lot, a lot with it. And I think if you keep that principle in mind, I think it would be very helpful to learn. OK, that was the preamble. Um, and let's actually begin some doing some code. So Josh and I thought we can kind of, you know, we can talk about so many things in Python, but we wanted a question, an analytical question that would anchor uh, the kind of code we'll be using today. So we thought about question, and our question is, how well can deprivation and other variables um, how well can deprivation and other variables predict the use of online services by GP practices? And to answer this question, we need to find what data sets we, we need. And there are two key data sets that we're using. One is from patient online. So this is a data set from NHS Digital, and it's basically information about what online services GP practices are using. So these services could be booking appointments, ordering repeat prescriptions. It's got data for each GP practice about this. The other is a very, very underrated data set in my view, which is PHE fingertips profiles. So, okay, it's not working. Okay, cool. So fingertips, uh, PHE England, what they used to be called, they've got like a load of indicators at different levels of area, so at GP level, different um, like uh, postcodes, and it's got all this information from physical activity to obesity to inequality, and there's like loads of data on here. And you can actually extract all this data using Python via an API. And just think about an API as sort of like just a cable between one system and another, it's just the connector. And so I extracted that data using an API, but I won't go into that today, but I'm just saying that's where I got the other data set from. But the main, main data set that we're going to talk about is um, patient online. Um, so the first thing you want to do is you want to import your libraries. And the very simple definition of a library it's just a collection of pre-packaged code that you can use for your purpose. And how I always thought about libraries is imagine you're going to a physical library, like an actual library. And 
different sections. There's geography, Spanish, there's cooking. And when you go to a library, you go to a specific section to learn and to have knowledge about a specific set of tools. And it's the same with Python. You go to a specific part of Python, you go to that library and you want a specific set of tools. And so the two libraries that we care about are a library called Pandas, data, data analysis, beautiful library for data analysis, and Matplotlib, which is a beautiful, beautiful, um, actually it's not that beautiful, can't lie, it's, it's okay, it's medium beautiful, but for data visualization. So those are the two main libraries that we're going to use. But the, the most important thing that you need to know as a data analyst is pandas, frankly. That is the most important thing. Um, you can ignore most other things. This is the most important thing you should learn. And there are two pieces of vocabulary in pandas that we'll use consistently, and I just want to be clear what they are. And one is called a data frame, and the kind of complicated definition is two-dimensional labeled data structure with columns of potentially different types. Basically a spreadsheet, that's basically what it is. Um, just think of it as just tables, table of data. The other one is a variable. So Python, what it does, it stores values as variables. The way to think about variables is to think of like a locker room. So if you think of, I don't know, you go to the office and everyone's got a different locker and everyone's storing their own personal stuff in each locker instead of always having those lockers open what python can do can find a specific locker and extract that data when it's necessary otherwise it just closes it and stores it for later that's kind of all it is it signs it a variable so we can store those values for later so okay step one we're going to import our library on anyways Great, so that's it's really, really easy to import a library. All you do is just import as PD. PD is just a really short way of saying pandas. Don't want to write pandas all the time. Our programmers are very lazy, so we make pandas just PD. And we import matplotlib, just import matplotlib with its alias, which is PLT. And one other thing that actually Josh taught me how to do was you could um, do something called web scraping and web scraping is basically extracting data directly from a web page so you avoid the whole faff of downloading something and so one thing we thought would be useful is we have a lot of information from our data set that we'll show you but we need to define the terms of that data set so if i go to patient online What I like about NHS Digital is they tend to have like really good data dictionaries and so they have this metadata which gives you what each um, what each variable means and instead of downloading that you can actually just extract it straight from the internet and you just basically put this link here and ask Python to just extract it from the internet and paste the feature name and the description. That's all that code is doing. I won't go into detail, but that's all that code is doing. And you can use this for your own projects. So let's data directly from the website. And this is great. OK, so we've got all the features of that data set and what their description is. So what these different features mean. OK, the next part is actually to ingest our actual data set from the website. Um, and there are kind of a couple ways to do this, different levels of difficulty. Uh, there's a really, really easy way to do it in Google Colab, which is just to just apply this code. And what it does, it just lets you choose your files. That's it. The other way is you can import your files manually here, and then you just say data. Pandas, I want you to read the CSV into my file, and it just brings it in. And the third one, and we only did this one because of the purposes of this presentation, we web scraped that data. And what Josh has done is he's hosted it on his own Google Drive, made that Google Drive open, and we've asked Python or Pandas to read that data in directly. Give it a minute. So I'm going to pause this one. Great, that's no problem. Wonderful. One thing to note about this file, by the way, it's a mega file. It's a very, very big file. It's 174 megabytes. It's not really possible to download on my computer. And so that's why we use this kind of cloud 
these cloud tools. Um, the second part is like, let's inspect our data. Did it actually come out as we expected? And all you have to do is basically put this function, pommy, uh, dot head. And let me just explain what pommy is. So we've got this URL. We've tried to extract this data. This data is here, but we need to assign it to a variable. And we've assigned it to a variable called pommy. And we're saying basically Python, um, whenever I write this word pommy, I'm referring to this data. That's all it's saying. And so what we're trying to do is say, I want this data that we've just imported to be called POMI, and I want to see the first five rows, POMI.head. Let's see what it looks like. Beautiful. OK, so we've got the data set. It's got different variables here. It's got the dates, it's got the region code. Um, it's got the different values, different fields. Perfect. Um, it's not a perfect data set, but this is, this is good. Um, I also want to see like what kind of data types we're looking at, what kind of um, nulls are there. So let's just put pommy.information. Um, OK, beautiful. So these are all the column names. These are how many non-null values there are. And these are the kind of different data types. And what I'm saying here is that there are a few nulls, which is fine. Um, and some of these data sets or data some of these columns do not have the right data type as well. So we're going to have to do a little bit of cleaning. Um, OK, and, and one one other thing you can do is you can do pommy.prescribe, which is just getting very nice aggregate statistics about um, some of your data. So with this in mind, I've noticed that report period end, which is essentially the date, is an object date type, which basically um, is, is, is kind of like a mega data type of all other data types. And one of those data types is strings, so pieces of text. So the fact that CCG name is an object is fine because that stores text. But no, we want we want the date, so that needs to be right. And so what you can do is you can convert these values um, back into their proper data type. And all you do is basically say, pandas, make this into a date time format and just run that code. That's all. Um, other things I noticed was that some of the uh, CCG names have actually changed. And so all you have to do is um, name your specific column and wherever there is a CCG name that is like wrong, you can just replace it with this. And that's all that code is doing. Um, so Hertfordshire CCG is not called that anymore. It's now called Hertfordshire and Worcester CCG. And it goes through the whole data set and changes that. Another thing that I did was I looked at the data set and some of the data, some of the um, columns and the names of CCGs were lowercase. I was like, that's going to get confusing. So let's just make them all uppercase. And that's what that code is doing. So let me just run now. Beautiful. And if we just test this. Great, so our report dates, our dates have been uh, rightly corrected into date time format, so that's good. Just um, got a quick question, Mary. How do you look at the, the data set? How do we look at the data set? Yeah. So basically, what you write is a very simple function. You can either write the name of the data set for me. And that gives you all the values. Or you can do pommy.head, which gives you first five, which is better for processing. Does that answer that question? Yes, yeah, thank you, so. Mary. Ah, no worries. No worries, everyone. Um, cool. All right. So I'm happy you asked that because there's actually something a bit wrong with the data. And this is partially how Energist Digital have collected it. Um, the actual values and, and uh, the actual values that we want are not structured correctly in this data frame. So um, all of these variables are, should actually be columns, but they're actually incorrectly imported as rows or values in a row. And so we need to unstack them so they come out of the actual data frame and become columns. And the way you can do that is you can use a function called unstack or you can use a pivot table, 
not many people know this, but you can actually create pivot tables with Python, which I find really cool. Um, so all you do is I'm going to make a new data frame. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to say, OK, pandas, make a pivot table based on POMI data. And all I want is I want you to extract this column called fields. And I want you to make these actual values columns instead. And I know that's a bit confusing, but we'll see the difference and then we'll discuss it. Cool. Let's see. Great, so what it's done, it's extracted all the data, well, all the, um, all the information from here and has made it into column. Cool. But now it looks kind of weird. It's kind of become a three dimensional table and I don't really like that. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of any irrelevant columns that we won't need for our question and reset this so it becomes an actual table. So that's why we need these two pieces of code. OK, that's beautiful. So now it looks like a table and it's only got um, the columns that we care about and it's taken all of these values out and made them columns. Cool. Um, the next thing is just to check we've done that properly. And the best way to do that is just check the patient list size. So uh, one of the variables here is just how many patients there are in each GP practice and it just need to check it against the date. And all you have to do is basically say, I want to check um, the date and I want to check how many patients there are in that date. And I want to summarize it by the individual dates. And we just kind of have to sense check this table. So does this make sense that in March 2020, there were 60 million people in the UK? Yes, that does. So that, OK, the data has been pivoted correctly. Fantastic. Um, Another thing we want to do is like, I don't really care about all the dates. I only care about a specific date in mind. And that date is the latest data we have, which is the 31st of March 2020. And all you do is just say, I want to filter that date uh, column to this uh, date period. And I want to create a new data frame for just information for that date period. And what it does, it filters all of this information to just be that date period here. Cool. So what we have is we have column with the date periods. We have all the practice names. We have their practice codes, which will come in handy later. We have how many people are using prescriptions, appointments, and the patient list size. So very, very helpful information. But at the same time, we kind of need to standardize this. So if someone in Liverpool is, you know, really, they really love ordering prescriptions and someone in a very small town, Putney, is not using it as much. Um, it's not necessarily because people in Liverpool love ordering prescriptions. It just needs to be, um, it's not compared fairly because of different uh, geographies and different populations. So you can standardize these sort of different geographies by accounting for population. And so what we're trying to do here is I'm like, OK, I want to create a new column here. A new column here, and I want that to be basically a per capita calculation. So I want to make a new column that's prescriptions use divided by the amount of patients in that area times by a thousand. And what that creates is a is a new variable that says how many prescriptions are ordered per hundred per ten thousand patients. So that's what let's just check it's worked. Cool. Beautiful. Okay, so it's taken the values from here, divided it by the values from here, and it's made this column. Beautiful. Okay, that was very easy. Okay. The next thing we want to do is we're, we're kind of in a happy place with this information here. Um, what we kind of want to do is just we want to connect the data from what we have here to the data we have in PHE fingertips. 
And the way we get the data from THG fingertips is very similar. Um, Josh has stored that data in his own Google Drive. I've just read it into Python and called it. And so this is all the data from PHE fingertips. And it's got data on um, deprivation scores for each GP practice. It's got different ages. It's got different proportions for male and female. So this is very, very juicy data that we can get stuck in with. Um, and the first thing we want to do is we want to join it on two columns that are basically um, that, that match between both data set one and data set two. And that column is essentially area code and practice code. So this is a unique identifier that uniquely identifies which GP practice we're talking about. And we want to connect these two rows using an inner join, and basically just connect them. So we get um, the data from online patients to, we get the data from patient online and we get the data from KG fingertips and we connect them like that. And it's really, really simple to do. All you do is you say what the first data set is called, you want to merge it with the second data set. And I want to do a left join. So I want to get this um, demographics data to join on practice code. And I want this online patients data to join an area code. And because we've done that, that leads to a data set called gpod data frame. Don't know why we've called it this actually. That is still a mystery to us, but this is a joint data frame that has data from what we've just created and the demographics. Cool. Okie dokie. And I just want to test that this has been joined correctly. So I want to just look at the practice codes and the area codes and see if they've been joined correctly. And as you can see, they all match. Cool. I also want to check if you know there's any missing data during this kind of merge. And all you have to do is just the name of your data set, see how many is now, and you just summarize them. And let's have a look. The cells got hidden for some reason. I think. Cool. Cool. So this is basically counting how many nulls there are. And it looks like, OK, no nulls, no nulls. Um, there are some nulls. And actually, that's fine, honestly, because we don't really care about this column. And actually, if some practices have some nulls when it comes to patient use of online services, that's OK, because they might not use that service. What matters, though, is that there are no nulls when it comes to um, practice code. So that's fine. Cool. The last thing we want to do is just get rid of some irrelevant columns. So whilst we merged it, there are some like duplicate columns. We don't need the practice code and the area code. So we say goodbye to them using this function. And that's all this function is doing. Please drop these columns from my data set. Cool. It's already done that. That's why I can't do it twice, but that's the code you use to do that. And then the final data set looks like this. And I think when Josh and I were talking, we realized actually, is it really helpful to have data about 90 to 94 or 95 plus? We can probably group some of these age categories together. That's really simple to do in Python. You just say what you want your new category to be. You want to you want to also say that equals all of these subcategories. And all you do is create all of those different lists, those categories and subcategories, add them together and make sure they add up to one, basically, because they're all proportions. And they do. The last aspect is just visualizing this data and using matplotlib to do that. So very, very little piece of code that you can copy and paste from the Internet can let you do a histogram. So let's just make a histogram. And this will look at all the variables and create a very, very quick histogram about it. There we go. So these are very small histograms for all the variables that we talked about, different distributions. And the last part is just to look at some box plots. So let's say I want to look at different depriva deprivation deciles against 
how many people are using prescriptions per capita. So let's just look at like, oh, that's pretty cool. Um, and that just helps you look at distributions and things like that. So that's a very, very brief overview on how we use data analysis libraries to filter our data, to aggregate it, to transform it, to clean it. And I'll hand it over to Josh, who will talk a bit more about how we convert that data into something of value using data science. Thanks, Mary. That was really good. Thank you. And I think Mary's bit is actually the most important bit uh, for people trying to learn Python. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some data science methods that you can do use um, doing Python. Um, I'm going to focus on one library called Scikit-learn, which is a really popular open source machine learning library, and it's really good for out of the box development of data science projects in Python. Um, it's got a massive community uh, behind it and lots of documentation and resources and also examples for uh, the kind of modeling that you're going to want to do. And it, it's just really perfect for uh, beginners and people who aren't um, experts in data science and machine learning to kind of quickly get started uh, in the projects. Um, so it's got lots and lots of functionality um, involved in this library. Um, so you can, like, going back to Mary's metaphor, there's loads of different books you can get. There's the ones on regression, classification, things like clustering, dimensionality reduction, model selection, pre-processing, and things like um, generating synthetic data. So it's really, it's a big library, essentially. Um, so yeah, it's got um, a few pros and cons that I could think of. Um, the main pro is always it's really easy to get going out of the box. Um, Another one which I think is quite good for um, people getting started um, uh, learning Python and uh, also scikit-learn is a consistent approach in code in regards to the implementation of models. Um, so essentially the, the structure of code is the same for uh, every kind of model that you'd want to implement. You just have to kind of change uh, the naming. Um, also, there's really excellent documentation and working examples. Uh, there's a massive community of support behind the library, which I mentioned before. Uh, and also quite important, I think, for the NHS is that it's open source, which means that you can kind of um, you can sign a C in to the code. You know exactly what's going on. Um, obviously, in the NHS, we have to be wary of um, malicious code, uh, things like that. So this is quite handy for, for us. Um, some cons, um, I think the main one is it's lack of uh, time series modeling tools um it does have this much chance but i think um definitely data scientists and statisticians and uh, economists prefer to use other tools um probably r is better for this kind of thing um and also um if you wanted to do some more sophisticated modeling such as deep learning then you probably want going to want some more uh, sophisticated libraries uh, things like pytorch and stuff like that uh, so going back to our analytical question that we had at the start um, of how well can deprivation schools predict GP practices use of online health services? Uh, so we're kind of framing the, the modeling question we have here and um, the response variable uh, which we're going to denote is why is the patient prescription use of uh, per 1000 registered patients? And this is what um, Mary kind of uh, did all the, the hard work data wrangling and uh, preparing for us earlier. Uh, and some features, we're only going to use a few um, just because, um, like we mentioned earlier, the point of this um, teach back is to more show what Python can do rather than having a really well performing model and that sort of thing. Um, so we're going to use uh, the deprivation score, obviously. Um, another feature um, is also the proportion of registered female uh, G uh, patients at each GP. Uh, and finally, the last uh, four features are proportion of patients who are in um, some age categories uh, between 1 to 19, 20 to 39, 40 to 59, 60 to 79 and 80. Uh, and we think um, before we kind of did this, we kind of thought these kind of features, are some of them are better than others at um, kind of tackling this analytical question, but um, we'll see uh, going on. Um, so, yeah, like I said, Mary did all the hard work for us doing um, the data cleaning and stuff like that. But for scikit-learn, you do have to kind of prepare the model a little bit um, before you feed it into the model. Um, so yeah, like I say, models, um, they only work with numbers. You can't just feed words into them. Um, so you have to kind of do a little bit of pre-processing on top of what Mary already did. Uh, and that's what we're going to do here. Um, so in this subsection with imputation, I think Mary mentioned earlier that there's a few missing values uh, and scikit-learn 
provides some really easy out of the box imputation. Uh, so this is what I'm doing here in this in this code section. So I'm in the first block of code, I'm importing the, the relevant libraries uh, from uh, scikit-learn, um, just a simple imputer. And um, the second block of code, I'm generating an object uh, from this library, uh, which kind of helps us do this imputation and then fitting it to our data and then doing a transformation on this data to impute any of the missing data. Um, and yeah, I think this is kind of just for an example. This imputation is done based on the mean of all of the observations in this column, and um, which is obviously quite simple, but there are other more sophisticated methods like using uh, things like K nearest neighbors, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, so yeah, have a have a look if you're interested in that. Uh, the next bit, obviously, in any kind of machine learning um, project, you're going to want to uh, make a train test split. Uh, this is because um, when you're training models, uh, you kind of want to have a, a generalization score. Um, so obviously, when you have models in production, they're not going to have the the same kind of data that you train on. So you want to have like a, a representation of how it's going to perform in the real world. Um, so this is what this set of code is doing. Uh, we're making two variables, y and x, which is storing our uh, before mentioned uh, response variable and features. And then the last line of code is just simply making the, the train and test, but it's as simple as that, just one line of code. Um, yep, yeah, I think that's fine. Uh, so now as the data is now prepared, we can get onto the fun bit, uh, which is modeling. Um, so uh, training a machine learning model on scikit-learn is really easy. Um, so at the very bare bones of it, it's literally just two lines of code. The first one being you need to create an object of the model, and the second one is fitting the object to your training data. It's that simple. Um, I think this is why a lot of data scientists are kind of worried for their jobs, um, because it's literally this easy um, to, to generate a model. Um, and yeah, the next uh, block of code. Uh, so this is more like a, an optional um, set of a data science project. Obviously, when you have a machine learning models, um, a lot of these models have what's called hyperparameters, which can be thought as uh, like dials or um, things that you can tune in the model to improve the performance um, of the models. Uh, and one way of kind of finding the best parameters um, or dials settings uh, for these models is using something called a, a grid search, um, which is quite um, quite brute forcey, um, which I think you find uh, quite common in the machine learning world, uh, where you kind of have a like a selection of different parameters, which you can see in this block of code uh, in param distributions variable. I'm making lots of different kind of uh, parameters that we can select from uh, and then selecting these parameters, trying out the model, uh, reporting the performance and repeating this again and again uh, for uh, a few different uh, samples of the parameters. Uh, and then eventually you pick the model which performs best. And this is essentially what this uh, block of code is doing. You can see Mary ran it uh, a little bit ago. It does take a little bit while to uh, to run uh, because obviously we are searching um, also parameters and, and training the models and testing the models. Uh, and yeah, you can see here for this model, we're actually using um, a gradient boosting model um, and it has a few different parameters. Here I'm testing out uh, the number of estimators, the max leaf nodes and the learning rate. Um, you don't need to know uh, too much about what these uh, are doing. I'd probably just keep in mind that uh, yeah, we're just trying to find the best performing model. Uh, so that's done. Uh, and if we run the next set of code, and this is going to report the performance of this grid search and it kind of sorts the the selection of parameters by the performance. So the, the top row uh, shows us the best parameters. Uh, we've got 500 for this first uh, hyperparameter, two for the second, and three for the third. And you can see this is giving us a mean test error of 8.98, um, which is uh, pretty good, I think. Um, so yeah, let's go to the next bit. So we're going to save the best model uh, to this variable called best model. Uh, and now we're going to evaluate the performance of the model. So scikit-learn uh, obviously has a lot of inbuilt um, metrics which you can use to evaluate your, your model. Uh, I'd probably say the main one here is the, the mean absolute error, which essentially is looking at on average. Um, how did you how much did you how much error did your did your model have? So we have a, a score of 8.8 .8 here uh, and in terms of the response variable, which I think was uh, deprivation, a score of 0 to 100. On average, we're mispredicting by about uh, eight which I think is about one decile. 
Uh, you can see we've reported this against the training and test sets uh, quite easily in a few blocks of code. Uh, so all this is just kind of reinforcing how easy it is to, to use scikit-learn um, for a data science project and how straightforward um, the code is. Uh, so next, um, this is this is an example of reinforcing how good the, the community and the documentation and examples are behind um, scikit-learn. So this is a block of code I actually copy pasted from uh, the scikit-learn documentation and all I had to do was change a few variables um, which is kind of plugged my data in to this set of code. And you can see this is the evaluating the feature importance of our model. And um, you can see here, it kind of stuck to me and Mary. We didn't think that the um, female proportion um, variable would be that important, but apparently it's the most important feature. Um, you can also see one to 19 years, which I think makes sense. Um, obviously, I think younger people are more likely to use online services. I think that's a sensible conclusion. And also you can see deprivation score there is um, a, a decent, important feature. Uh, so yeah, um, do you want to skip this bit, Mary? I think um, we are running a little bit short of time. Maybe um, we could leave this for uh, people to look at themselves. I think because we I think we still have 15 minutes. I think it would be valuable to do five minutes on this because okay. this is the vocabulary I think most economists are used to. Yeah, OK, so um, so yeah, I think a lot of economists and statisticians come from a background of using R and um, this is like completely understandable. I think R is like pretty much the best tool for using this sort of stuff. Um, but I do want to introduce a library in Python called Stats Models, which does implement uh, the same kind of um, like user interface and also the same kind of um, coding structure that you use in Python. Um, so I kind of I want to skip the pros and cons just for time um, and skip towards the, the fitting and linear regression and this done in R style. Uh, so you can see here the string that we've got in the middle section of the code. Uh, this is the kind of way that you use typically in R to, to define a, a linear regression model. Um, and this can be done um, conveniently using stats models. Uh, and also you, you train the model in the same way of using R. Uh, you can also get the predictions, which looks conveniently exactly like you would in R. And my favourite bit is this bit, uh, which outputs the results exactly as you'd see in R as well, which is very convenient. I love how they've just kind of stolen all of the, the neat features of R. Um, and the next section just uh, shows, uh, also you can look at the, you can evaluate the performance as usual uh, with stats models and also you can do things like, um, I think it's quite important for statisticians and economists to look at things like collinearity, which is where um, explanatory variables are really highly correlated and therefore you have kind of, kind of problems with the mathematical assumptions of uh, linear regression. Uh, so here we looked at variation inflation factor, which I think is commonly abbreviated as VIF. Uh, and yes, stats models has this kind of uh, tools involved as well. Uh, but yeah, I think stats models, the one big downfall is that it doesn't have all of the, the functionality that you kind of see in our things like feature selection. I was trying to get an example of doing things like backwards and forwards feature selection um, based on a few different metrics like AIC, but I don't think this was implemented yet in stats model. I might be wrong, uh, but I think the one key strength um, of stats models is the forecasting, um, which is, is pretty good. Um, I've heard I've not done it myself, but uh, yeah, I think that's probably the, the one advantage. Uh, I think that's everything we, we wanted to show, right, Mary? Yep. So yeah, we welcome any questions or uh, queries or thoughts. Um, yeah, are there any questions? I think um, one key thing whilst um, we're waiting for people to think if they've got a question, um, we are wanting to kind of post this on the NHS PyCom GitHub at some point. Uh, so we will be asking for any kind of feedback you have just to kind of improve this anyway before we kind of shift it out to, to other people. Um, so yeah, we'd be really thankful if um, we could get your feedback on this sort of thing. Another thing to mention is like, it's totally okay if none of it made sense because this is just a summary of information that we've been learning over the last year. And what we'll do is we'll email whoever attended or the email list, a, a list of really, really good resources 
uh, to learn this stuff. And one thing we did at the analytics unit, we had a coding club where it had different applications of Python and how we can use it specifically in healthcare. So this is an example of one that Johnny Pearson from NHSX did about APIs. Um, and basically it goes through what is an API, how to use APIs, what code do you use and different exercises. So we'll send you all of these on the way back. Um, yeah, if, if, are there any questions, George? Um, I think there was a question from Adele. Uh, contraception repeat prescriptions. Uh, I'm not exactly sure. Sorry, that wasn't a question. I was just wondering why young women maybe. Um, uh, eyes, I thought that might be a potential uh, insight. Like, yeah, that's a good thought, actually. I didn't think of um, that. That's such a good idea. Um, I think we might have stunned people into silence. Which is <laughs> a lot of information to digest. Um, thank you so much. Another thing we want to mention is we are doing a collaborative coding club session with NHSX at the end of June to show the different applications of like Python in health, digital transformation, economics. So that will be coming soon. We might ask um, some of you guys to present at that as well. Um, was there any other updates, Josh? No, there's no questions, just a few comments that we can take away. Uh, but yes, yeah, I think that's um, uh, Svetlana talked about how Python's really uh, the most uh, human language friendly language that we've seen. Um, I think that's the big plus of Python compared to other languages. Um, and I think it's why it's so popular. It's really easy to, to get started on. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, I think if there's no other questions, we'll leave just 10 minutes early. Thank you so much for your attention. I hope this is giving you a little bit of urgency about learning this stuff. We'll send you resources. And yeah, have a beautiful, beautiful Tuesday and see you soon. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Josh, as well.